Hello, everyone. This talk is on literate documentation with Emacs and org mode. I'm going to take just a moment here to unpack what I just said. Emacs, as most of us probably already know, is a powerful text editor and Lisp programming environment from the 1970s. Chances are, if you're attending this talk, you already know a bit about Emacs. Org mode is an Emacs major mode and authoring tool that helps you write documents in a plain text markup language called org. These org documents can be exported to a number of different document formats like HTML, PDF, ODT, Markdown, and more. Org mode has a lot of features. It can be an outliner, a to-do list manager, an agenda organizer, and much more. Today we're going to be demonstrating what I consider to be org mode's killer feature called org babel. Babel allows you to take human language prose, computer language source code blocks and their outputs and weave them together seamlessly to form a cohesive document. It is seriously cool. Literate documentation is a play on the term literate programming popularized by Donald Knuth in the early 1980s. Knuth's literate programming idea was that computer programs could be expressed in a natural language and be human-readable documents rather than written exclusively for machines to read. In a traditional program, you might have a bunch of machine-readable source code and a handful of human-readable comments, which attempt to describe what the program is doing. Literate programming flips this on its head. A literate program is a document that describes how the program works with machine-readable source code blocks inside of it. These source code blocks are later tangled out of the document and submitted to the machine either to be compiled or interpreted and ultimately run. Throughout this presentation, you'll see my browser window here on the left side of the screen. And on the right side, I've got a terminal session running Tmux. This allows us to have a virtual terminal window connected to two separate Linux machines, one running Ubuntu Server 2204 and another running Fedora Server 38. I've specifically chosen these two distributions for my demo because they are representative of the two dominant flavors of GNU Linux, Debian and Red Hat. In both cases, these are bare-bones server editions with the stock packages installed. I've manually installed a few packages like git emacs-nox to get the terminal version of emacs and tmux. But otherwise, these Linux installs are what you'd get right out of the box. For this demo, I've created a literate org mode document that describes how to build GNU Emacs from its source code on both Debian and Red Hat based systems. While both operating systems are very similar, they differ substantially on which packages are installed out of the box, how optional packages are named, searched, and installed, and of course, the distributions have different names like Ubuntu or Fedora. I chose building Emacs from source as a topic for this demonstration because while the process is largely the same on both Red Hat and Debian, there are a lot of minor little differences that need to be accounted for, which really prohibits you from hard coding names of packages and package management tools and distributions into your document. I suppose you could create two versions of the same document, one specifically for Red Hat and one specifically for Debian, but that would be really tedious to maintain. Like if, for example, you updated some pros in one document, you'd have to remember to do it in the other one too. And if you weren't careful, the two documents could drift out of sync. In this demo, I'll show you techniques for creating dynamic literate documents that can change based on parameters and constants embedded into the non-exported regions of the document. I'll show how with a single org mode source document, you can press a couple of keys to configure it to export a Red Hat specific version of my building Emacs from source essay or a Debian specific version. All right, let's get started. We'll begin by firing up a new terminal Emacs session on my Ubuntu machine. 
Now, I installed Emacs on this machine using apt-get. And doing that, you get version 27.1, which is, hey, only two major versions behind the current version of Emacs. This is another reason why I thought writing a guide on how to build Emacs from source code might be a good idea. You can get a much newer version of Emacs on Ubuntu if you install it via Snap, but uh, snaps. Don't get me started. Now I wanted to use a completely vanilla terminal mode install of Emacs for this demonstration because my personal Emacs config has a ton of packages installed and is heavily modified. I want folks to be able to follow along with a bog standard out of the box Emacs config. The Emacs config on this Ubuntu machine has just two settings. I require org tempo because my fingers are hardwired to use some of the handy shortcuts that it provides. And I also turn off the menu bar because I just can't stand to look at it. Let's begin by opening a file called buildemacs.org, which will be the source code for our literate org mode document. Now in preparation for this talk, I've already written this document and we'll take a look at the finished product here in a bit, but let's first take a look at how we might approach this task. We'll start at the top of the document by filling out some export keywords. These keywords are something that every backend exporter, be it LaTeX or plain text or ODT or whatever, understands and are essentially document metadata. As you can see, I'm typing pound sign plus followed by a couple characters and then meta tab to autocomplete. If you hit pound sign plus by itself and then meta tab, you can see all the possible completions. And as you can see, there's a lot. The next thing we're going to do is make a readme section at the top of this document. This section is intended for folks who are looking at the org mode document, trying to figure out what it's for. We don't want to actually export this section heading, so we're going to tag it with the no export tag. And then here we just write something quick to let folks know that this document can potentially execute code and just a little something about what the document is for. Okay, so now that we've written some text, let's try our hand at writing a code block. I'm getting pretty sick of looking at the default Emacs theme. All that blue and purple in the document makes it look bruised. Let's make an Emacs list code block that switches the theme to one of my favorite built-in themes, Leuven. Leuven was created by my man, Fabrice Neeson, who I personally have learned a ton of org mode stuff about just by studying his work. Now, if we cruise back up to the code block, we should be able to hit control C, control C and have it execute. And there you have it, a high contrast color theme that was designed to look great in org mode. So that's great and all, but there are a couple of things I don't like. First of all, we don't need to see a results block here. And that's because we're not really interested in what the Emacs Lisp function load theme returns. I mean, it's great at return T and all to indicate success. We just don't need to see it. We can slap a results none header arg on the code block to keep things nice and clean. There are a lot of different header args, and I often confuse and misremember them. So I'll always refer back to the org mode manual when working with them. The second thing I don't like is that when we hit control C, control C to execute the block, Emacs prompted us if we really wanted to run the block. Emacs Lisp is Emacs's mother tongue, and I don't want to be hassled when speaking my native language. There's a variable that controls this called org confirm babble evaluate. And this can be either set to T or nil to either always confirm or never confirm. If, however, you provided a lambda, an anonymous function, org will call your function with the name of the language and the source block that it's about to run. And your function can make the decision about if Emacs should ask you for confirmation or not. What I'm doing here is setting org confirm babble evaluate as a file local variable. This means whenever the file is opened by Emacs, it'll set this variable to be a lambda that returns nil, meaning don't confirm, on elisp code blocks. As you can see, the variable is currently set to its default value of t, meaning always confirm. Now if we save the buffer, exit Emacs, and pop back in again, org confirm babble evaluate should be set how we like it. 
We were, however, prompted for confirmation on setting the file local variable, which controls if we're prompted for elisp source code block evaluation. I feel like there's a yo dog joke here somewhere. When we were prompted, we hit the exclamation mark, which automatically marks this variable as being safe, so you won't be bothered the next time you open this file. This variable is called safe local variable values. And if we pop over to our .emacs file, you can see that Emacs's customized tooling helpfully updated this variable in our config file for us. Now that's great and all, but I really don't like having to hit control C, control C on that source block every time I open this document just to bring up the Leuven theme. Let's have this source block run automatically every time the document is opened. Now I know what you're thinking. Shouldn't you just put all of this configuration stuff in your .emacs file and keep it out of the document? Well, that's what I've done with my personal Emacs config, but we want this document to be able to be used by folks with a completely vanilla Emacs setup, or even a completely tricked out Emacs setup, so we can't assume anything. The idea is, if the Emacs user who opens the document agrees to setting all of the variables and running all of the code within, they'll be able to export the document as well as run all of the code blocks inside of it, just as we intended and the differences in base Emacs configuration will be completely minimized. Now it's worth pointing out that the file local variables we're setting here are local, in this case, buffer local. The configuration we use in this document won't override someone's carefully constructed org mode setup. The first thing we're gonna to wanna to do in order to make this block execute when the document is loaded is to give it a name. It's always a good idea to give every source block you create in your document a unique name, even if you don't refer to it elsewhere. I do this because when I'm debugging my documents, Emacs will prompt me about running a block. If the block has a name, Emacs mentions it, and I know there's a problem with the result caching or something with the foo block. But if the block doesn't have a name, it can be really hard to figure out which block Emacs is complaining about. So I always name my blocks. Now we're gonna add another file local variable, but this one is special. If your quote unquote variable just happens to be named eval, it means that Emacs should evaluate the Lisp expression that follows. Here we'll use the progn function to sequentially run two Elisp functions and return the value of the last one executed. The first function is org babble go to named source block, which jumps us to the startup block. The second one is org babble execute source block, which executes the current source block. That should get the job done. Now all we have to do is save the document, exit Emacs, jump back in, and once we've confirmed that we're willing to run the new eval line in our file local variables, we're good to go. Now if we want to add new configuration stuff to the document, we can just add it to the startup block and not have to muck about with confirmations or adding new file local variables or whatever. And just like before, we'll let Emacs's customized system save this decision to our .emacs file. Now that all that business with confirmations, file local variables, and the startup block are out of the way, we can get on with writing our introduction. We'll create a new top-level headline called Introduction and explain to the reader of the exported document what this is all about. Now, as you can see, we've actually hard-coded the name of the Linux distro in our prose. I promised you a single document that could be for either Red Hat or Debian distros, so we can't have this. Astute members in the audience have probably been uneasy ever since I hard-coded the name Debian in the README section above. One way of solving this problem is by using exclude tags. Let's add the exclude tags export keyword to our document. This keyword tells the exporter, hey, if you see a headline tagged with any of these tags, don't export it. By default, the tag no export is excluded. And if you'll notice, we tagged our readme section with that tag so it doesn't show up in the exported document. We'll keep this tag in the list but we'll also add the tag Red Hat as a tag to exclude. Now it's just a matter of creating two introduction sections, one for Debian, one for Red Hat, 
And if you want the Red Hat version of the document, you can just modify the exclude tags line at the top of the document. Awesome, right? Right? Okay, this is not that great. Well, it does work. And you can see if we export the document, we'll get something that only references Debian and the no export and Red Hat tagged headlines are omitted. This strategy would work great when the Red Hat and Debian specific sections are substantially different, but that's not the case with the introduction. We definitely don't want to have to maintain two distinct introductions. I also noticed that the export tags are included in the exported document. Blech. That's a terrible default. We'll fix that and we'll also ensure that my email address appears at the top of the document. Let's also take this opportunity to get rid of the table of contents. We don't need it. These are all export option settings and can be modified using the options keyword at the top of the doc. The manual is really your friend here as there are a ton of export options. Now when we export the document again, it should look a lot better. Now that we've cleaned up the look of the exported document, we'll take a look at a better way of solving the problem with the introduction. Thinking like a programmer for a moment, what I really want here is a way of specifying a constant. Rather than hard coding the name Debian or Red Hat or whatever into my document, I want to substitute that text with a symbolic constant named something like distro that can dynamically change to Debian or Red Hat or Slackware or whatever, depending on how the document is configured. In the past, I've come up with some pretty cumbersome ways of doing this, but eventually I stumbled upon the idea of using org mode properties as a way of storing these constants. Like it says in the docs, properties are key value pairs that are associated with an entry and they live in a collapsible properties drawer. Let's do a bit of cleanup on our document and we'll put things into sections. We'll also add a section for document constants. And that's where we'll put the property drawer with the distro property. Now the question is, how do we reference these properties in the document? It turns out there's an elisp function called org property values, which does what we want. If we run it and give it the name of our property, it returns a list with the string Debian in it. It's worth noting that this function is named org property values with values being plural. In org mode, there could be a property named foo that has different values depending on which heading level you're at in the document, which is why the function returns a list. For our purposes though, we can just pull off the first value in the list with car and we're good to go. Now we'll make an Emacs Lisp function called getprop that does just that. This function takes one argument called prop, which is the property to look up, and we'll give it a default value of distro, so we can hit control C, control C on the block to verify that it works. Now we just have to make an inline call to our git prop function within the pros of the introduction section, and that should get us much closer to not hard coding distro names into our document. But before we do that, I need to clean up something that's been bothering me. By default, Emacs's fill column variable is set to 70 characters, which may have been appropriate for 1970, but it's not great for 2023. We'll just cruise up to our startup block and set the variable there. We'll hit Control C, Control C, and now our document will wrap at 100 columns, which for our purposes, I think is much more reasonable. The org mode syntax for making an inline function call within the pros of your document is call underscore, followed by the name of the function, some optional header arguments, and then the function arguments. Now, when we export the document, we see that it's replaced our previously hard-coded Debian with the value from the property. Huzzah! Now, this is close to, but not exactly what we want. You can see that Debian is surrounded by a backtick and a single quote, which is the plain text exporter's way of showing you verbatim text. In more sophisticated document backends, verbatim text is rendered in monospace. 
We can fix that by adding a results raw header argument to the inline call. Now when we export the document, it looks like what we'd expect. Now this is getting better, but it's still not great. The call underscore syntax is pretty cumbersome, and it's a lot to type every time we want to reference a constant and not have it be marked up as verbatim. This is where org mode macros come to our rescue. If we head to the top of the document, we can create a couple of macros using the macro export keyword. We'll define two macros with short names, one named P for property, and the other one named PR for property raw. Org mode macros are expanded when the document is exported and any positional arguments provided are referenced by their number. Now in the introduction, we can use the macro replacement syntax which is three curly braces, followed by the macro name and any arguments, and then three ending curly braces. You can see why I kept the macro name short. That's six curly braces in total we're typing, which still takes up a fair amount of space. Now let's take a look at how we might use these properties in practice. Debian and Red Hat distros differ on how they install packages. So we're gonna want an install property, where in Debian we use sudo apt get install dash qq. And on Red Hat, we'll use something like sudo dnf install dash y. Now, development packages also have a different naming convention. For example, the ncurses library on Debian is called libncurses dash dev where on Red Hat, it's called ncurses-devel. There are likely going to be many more little differences like this that we'll need to solve with properties. Now, I already don't like where this is going. Switching between the Debian and Red Hat versions of the document is gonna mean commenting and uncommenting out a bunch of different properties, which is pretty janky. Luckily, we can solve this problem with a little bit of Emacs Lisp. We'll start by modifying our properties. So their property names are prefixed with either deb underscore or rh underscore to signify which distro the property applies to. We'll also create a single property called prefix, which will be prepended to the property name by the getprop function if the requested property is not found. This way, when we want to switch between the Debian and Red Hat versions of the document, we just need to change the prefix property. So now we'll change the ELISP code. So we'll use a let expression with two bound variables. The first one is called ret, which determines if the initial call to org property values succeeds. The second variable is called prefix, which is the prefix property. If the first call to org property value succeeds, we return it as normal. If not, we can catenate the property value that was passed into the function onto the prefix and try again. Now when we call the git prop function with distro as the prop argument, it won't be found. So the code will slap our prefix tag on the front, making it something like rh underscore distro, and it will be found and returned. Let's see that in action. All right, now we're talking. This setup is starting to look pretty good, but there are just a few things that I want to add before we move on. First of all, I think the document should have a subtitle, something that tells you if you're looking at the Red Hat or the Debian version of the document. I also think it would be great if the file name of the exported document reflected the distribution as well. I also want to add a quick Debian-only section to the document that explains how it got its name. Now let's see what happens when we export the document. This did not work out as we wanted. As you can see, the macro we used in the subtitle didn't expand properly, and as a result, our subtitle didn't render right. Sadly, you can't use macros or inline function calls everywhere and one place where they don't work is inside of certain export keywords. So we're gonna have to hard code them here. Another mistake that we made is we forgot to update the exclude tags export keyword. 
because with the Red Hat version of the document, we want to exclude the Debian tag. Now when we export the document, everything should be correct. The word Red Hat should appear in the subtitle, and the Debian Fun Facts section should not be present. Now we just need to add a section to the README that explains the steps you need to take in order to switch the document from Red Hat to Debian. Okay, let's see here. Uh, we have to change subtitle, change the exclude tags, change the export file name, and change the prefix property. This is okay, but it's not great. Emacs Lisp can once again come to our rescue. What we'll do is make an ELISP code block that will invite the user to hit Control C, Control C on. And the code block will essentially make all these changes in the document for them. This code block, which we'll call switch distro, takes one argument called OS, which by default is set to Debian. It starts out with a let expression that defines three bound variables. The Debian variable is a Boolean that is true if the distro we're switching to is Debian. Based on the value of this Boolean, we'll set the no export and prefix variables accordingly. The save excursion block tells Emacs that we're going to be moving around in the document and to remember to put our point back where we started when the block finishes. After that, we essentially go to the top of the document and search and replace the subtitle, exclude tags, export file name, and the prefix. Pretty cool. Let's see this in action. If we hit Control C, Control C on this block, we should see the document automatically change a bit. And now when we export it, we get the Debian version of the doc. If we want to change it back, we can just head back over to the code block and change the default value for the OS variable from Debian to Red Hat and hit Control C, Control C again. And now when we re-export, we're looking at the Red Hat version of the document. Just as an aside, if you ever thought to yourself, I should learn Emacs Lisp someday, Make it someday soon. You'll be happy you did. Not only is it a fun programming language, but you can do powerful things with it in Emacs, which I hope is a point that folks take away from this talk. All right, that was a lot. Now that we've spent the past 20 minutes or so digging into some of the tips and tricks I used when creating my Build Emacs from Source document, we'll say goodbye to this document we've been working on and we'll start a tour of the actual literate document I wrote. A document that I'll demonstrate actually downloading and building GNU Emacs when I export it on both my Ubuntu and Red Hat virtual machines. I'll also show you how org mode can generate slick professional looking PDF files through the power of LaTeX. We'll start here at the org demo2 directory, which I've cloned from GitLab. This repository has all the source materials for this talk. The buildemacs.org file is where most of the good stuff is, so that's where we'll start. There's a lot of file local variables that we'll need to confirm, so we'll do that too. So the first thing we're going to do is hit Control u tab twice, which will give us a top-level overview of all of our headings. As you can see, we've got a lot of the same familiar export keywords we had before. Title, subtitle, author, email, plus a few we haven't seen before. For example, I've squirreled away a lot of the latex header export keywords in this file called latex.setup. And I did this just so they don't clutter up the document. Much of the LaTeX magic that makes the exported document look good is in these headers. LaTeX commands begin with a backslash, and a common one we use a lot here is backslash use package. This lets us bring in packages like geometry, SVG, uh, for the cool Siegel SVG logo, fancy header and fancy verbatim to keep things looking pretty fancy. Using a scalable vector image format makes it possible for us to do really cool things like having a scaled down version of the Siegel logo appear in the fancy footer below. I also include some macros in a separate file just to help keep things tidy in the main document. Here I've got the familiar macros we've seen before for get prop. But here I use different permutations depending on if I want results raw or raw verbatim or just verbatim. I also have a couple macros here at the top of the file that are for pulling strings out of results blocks and then trimming them so there's no white space on either side. 
Like in the version of the document we worked on at the start of this talk, the real document also has a README section marked with the No Export tag. It also has a section about choosing which version of the document to export, and a code block on how to switch between them. It's also got a lot of helpful information in it, like what OS and Emacs versions the document has been tested to quote unquote run on, a section on the LaTeX prerequisites, and a section on executing the document's various code blocks. The latter two sections we'll take a look at now. Out of the box on Fedora and Ubuntu server distros, the tech typesetting system, also by noted computer scientist Donald Knuth, is not installed, so we'll need to install some packages. Starting out, we'll need the tech live package, which gets you a fully featured tech setup. This also gets you LaTeX, which can be viewed as a distribution of tech macros. You'll also need Exitech. This gets you Unicord support and lets you use modern fonts. We'll also want to install PDF Tech. This gets us the ability to generate PDFs from tech sources. And finally, we're going to need to install LaTeX MK, which is a Perl script that knows how to run LaTeX multiple times in order to properly deal with intra document links. But wait, there's more. We're also going to need Inkscape to rasterize our Siegel Vector logo at different resolutions. And we're going to need the JetBrains mono font to make our source code look snazzy. We'll also need the Inter font to make our prose look snazzy as well. I've helpfully added a bash code block in the README that you can hit Control C, Control C on to install. This really does lock up Emacs for a few minutes, and it's sort of annoying. When we export the document and turn off all caching, and it actually builds Emacs for real, Emacs can be locked up for tens of minutes. There's a package called ob async that I've been meaning to check out that might help here, but since I wanted this document to work on bog standard Emacs setups, I didn't get around to it. Before we get into talking about running the document, let's talk briefly about results caching. We'll take a look at the section of the document where we talk about git tags for an example. The num tags bash code block determines how many tags there are in the Emacs git repo. And when I hit control C, control C on that block several days ago, when I was first creating the document, that number was 183. That result has remained cached in the document since then. And you can see a snippet of the SHA-1 hash of the contents of the source block below. You can see where I reference the result using the SR for string raw macro in the prose below and how it gets rendered in the exported PDF document. All the source blocks in the exported sections of the document include cached results like this. If I export the document now, it won't take that long to do because while there are a ton of code blocks in the exported sections, they're all cached. Now let's get back to the section of the README that explains how to execute the code in the document. Here I explain that if you want to build Emacs on your computer using this document, you've got a couple of options. The first option is to manually invalidate the caches and hit Control C, Control C on every code block in the main document. This lets you supervise the entire process and it also creates new cached result blocks, but it's time consuming. There is also an internal link to the main document here, and you can jump to it with Control C, Control O. This is one of those intra document links that is really tricky to get right with LaTeX, and is why we opted to use the LaTeX MK Perl script to build the PDF version of the document. I'm mentioning it specifically here because it took me forever to figure this out. The second option you've got is to change the default header arg from cache yes to cache no at the top of the document. If we cruise up to the top of the document, you can see that this header argument property basically says that unless a code block explicitly says otherwise, it's by default supposed to be cached. That's how we were able to export the document before so quickly. The code block named no cache, no confirm uses the save excursion and regex replace trick 
that I demonstrated earlier to munge the default cache header arg from cache yes to cache no. And it also turns off confirmations on bash code blocks. Let's do that now. Now we'll export the document to PDF, which will ignore the cached result blocks and clone the Git repository on Savannah, create a branch that points to the most recently tagged version of Emacs 29, run configure a handful of times, installing packages to fix missing dependencies along the way, build Emacs, install Emacs in our home directory, verify that it has successfully built a binary, run it in batch mode with some sample elisp, and show the file sizes and dates of the generated files. This is going to take a while, and while it's running, we'll pop over to our Fedora box. All right, now we'll fire up Emacs, hit Control-C, Control-C on the Configure Document code block to configure the document for Red Hat, since Fedora here is a Red Hat-based distro. Then what we'll do is we'll pop down and hit Control-C, Control-C on the RH install LaTeX code block to install the LaTeX prerequisites for this Fedora virtual machine. Finally, we'll execute the no cache, no confirm block and then kick off the export. Then we'll go and check back on what's happening on the Ubuntu box. Ooh, top looks pretty quiet. I think the export is complete. Ooh, those are the words I love to see in the status area. PDF file produced. Now I can't use my web browser to take a look at this PDF file because I haven't set up a web server or anything like that on the Ubuntu virtual machine. I can, however, use tramp with the SSH method to poke around on the Ubuntu host on my personal version of Emacs. So let's do that. Okay, so now if we go into the source directory and then we hop into the org demo 2 directory and then we look at the deb version of the PDF, there she blows. Now, if we uh, go down to the building Emacs section, we can see that it built. And if we look in the bin directory, we can see that at 1701, that's when the, all of those files got created. Also, the file creation date on the PDF is 1701. So all of this code executed roughly the same time the PDF was created. All right, so now let's head back over to the Fedora box, and then we'll navigate to the source directory, the org demo 2 directory, and there is our Red Hat version of the build Emacs PDF. And Bob's your uncle. And you can see it is the Red Hat version of the document, because this is a Red Hat box. And if we go over to the what did we install section, you can see that these binaries were built at 1735. And now if we pop open Dured and we take a look at the PDF, we can see it also was created at 1735. All right, in the couple minutes remaining, I thought it would be a good idea just to take a look at the document and um, you know, maybe just go through some of what it actually does in explaining how to build Emacs from source. We'll look at the Red Hat version since we're here. And the first thing you do is you have to like get access to the source code. And before you can do anything, this is a Red Hat specific section where you need to install some development tools. And this development tools group actually has Git. Now I installed Git earlier, but if you didn't do that, that would be the first thing that you need to do. We create a source directory, we CD into it, we clone the repo from Savannah, and then we start to take a look at some of the Git tags. And you know, we, uh, we showed this before where we check out how many different tags there are. And then we run this kind of funky Git command to sort of list all the tags that begin with Emacs 29, and we sort them by when they were tagged. So we can see that Emacs 29.1.pretest is the most recent version. So that's the one we grab and that's the one we decide to build. And then we, you know, create a branch that is based on this tag. And this is dynamically generated based on, you know, what we saw here. So that's what we use here. In this case, we're piping uh, 
standard error to where standard out goes. That's another trick. If you want to actually see an error get created, org mode will capture any errors that code blocks produce and it will show you the error message in a buffer. So if you actually want to show what it looks like when something errors out, this is the trick you have to use. And then what we do is um, we look for a configure script and there isn't one. And then we realize, uh oh, we're going to have to deal with auto tools. So, you know, we run the auto gen script and it complains because we're missing some prerequisites. So we have to install autoconf and then we run it again. And finally, it generates a configure script. And this is another case where I pull this number right here into the actual pros. And I can see it's, oh, it's, you know, this is how many bytes. When was the last time you wrote a shell script that was this many bytes long? And then we configure the build process. And, you know, it's not going to work right away because we don't have GNU text info installed. So we got to do that, which we do with DNF install here. And then there's this section that is either, either Red Hat or Debian specific that uh, talks about, like, if you don't know the name of a package that contains a given file name, how do you query it? And in the uh, Red Hat world, you use DNF provides make info. In the Debian world, you do something entirely different. And um, then we have to install the incurses binary. And finally, we get like a minimal configuration. And you can see that there's a whole bunch of no's here. <laughs> so, um, you know, we don't have Cairo. We don't have image magic. We don't have Dbus. You know, there's a whole bunch of stuff we don't have. We don't have X, we don't have Liv Jansen, no tree sitter. This is really a bare bones Emacs that is strictly terminal mode. Then we actually build Emacs, which is, you know, kind of boring. We're just going to type make and then make's going to run successfully. And make is going to spew a ton of output, right? So here's where I do that dev null trick where I pipe everything to dev null and then I, or I pipe standard output to dev null and then I pipe standard error to wherever standard output's going. And then at the end, to say that it ran successfully, I say make ran successfully. Then we take a look at the Emacs binary and you know, it's an elf binary. And you know, because this is running on my Mac, this is an ARM based machine. This virtual machine is, oops, and this is a bug. This really should be a macro call, but I think I have the wrong number of curly braces or something in there. I need to figure out why that's uh, not right. I'll look into that later. Um, and then we install Emacs and then we kind of show like the file sizes of everything in the home directory. Um, and then we, you know, show the binaries that got installed. Anyway, so this is the final thoughts section. And my final thoughts are, is I hope you enjoyed this talk and I hope you actually learned a thing or two. All right, thanks everybody. And I'll see you all next time.